So you heard, um, I am the member of provincial parliament for Kitchener Centre. Prior to this, I was the director of diversity and equity at Wilfrid Laurier University. Prior to that, I was a mommy of three. And prior to that, I was part of a tradition that began in Nigeria and through the slave trade landed in Cuba and from Cuba came to North America. And when I am in particularly high and intense situations like a TED talk, I like to sing a little song to ground myself. So if you can just give me a moment, I'm gonna keep it together. Picture this. 2018, I have been the member of provincial parliament for a whopping five months. I get contacted and asked to come and speak at this amazing conference. It's like 100 black students across uh, Waterloo Region District School Board. They come together for something called Black Brilliance. I am there to bring provincial greetings. So I get like all excited and I go in and it's all sorts of black folks, which in case you're wondering in schools is rare. And I stand at the podium and I say to everybody, hey folks, I am your member of provincial parliament for Kitchener Center. I am the first black person elected at any level of government in Waterloo Region. Yeah! <laughs> Except no. It's like you folks knew what I was thinking. I actually stopped them like I'm going to stop you because this is 2018 and I am the first black person elected at any level of government in Waterloo Region? I actually said it and I took in the applause and then I stopped it and I went, whoa. So I took a year, you know, did work, fought some battles, back and forth, Queen's Park, and here, and was asked back. So now a year has gone and things have changed. At this point, as I'm coming to bring official greetings from the province, I'm doing so not only as the critic for anti-racism and the critic for citizenship and immigration, but I'm also now the chair of the official opposition's Black Caucus. And we have been spending time at Queen's Park fighting to make sure that the Minister of Education takes seriously examples of anti-black racism that have actually made their way into mainstream media in the Peel District School Board. I was exhausted the day that I was going to Black Brilliance. I was actually on a Greyhound. Next TED Talk is about transportation in Kitchener. <laughs> so I'm on a Greyhound. And I'm reading this report by Carl James. And it's called We Rise Together. And he has a number of quotes from students in the Peel District School Board. And this one quote is going around and around and around in my mind. It's a grade seven student who says that every single day that they go to school, they hear the N-word. Every single day they go to school, they hear the N-word. Can you imagine going to work every day and hearing the N-word? So I couldn't get it off my brain. As you can probably tell, that changes everything. She had a script, she has no script. I walk into Black Brilliance, I get up to the podium, and I said to them, look, I was just reading this article and I'm hearing this grade seven student in Peel is hearing the N-word every day. We are in Waterloo Region. How many of you hear the N-word when you go to school and every single student raised their hand? I was like, oh, I'm overwhelmed, like I am right now. And I paused, and I said, how many of you have the N-word directed to you at school? And only half of them put their hands down. I can tell you that I was taken aback, 
but I cannot tell you that I was surprised. Because during that year, I had a number of people come to visit me at Queen's Park. I had a group called um, the Parents for Black Children that came to speak to me and talk to me about anti-black racism in the school system across Ontario. I had been to Hamilton, I was asked to speak at McMaster with high school and university students, and they told me about the experiences of exclusion that they were feeling at their schools and in their campuses, the lack of attention to their histories in, their, in the curriculum that they were being offered, and the kinds of interactions that they were having as black people walking down the street in their community. And I had been blessed to speak to some folks from the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, who explained to me that because of the heightened attention to anti-black racism in schools in Hamilton, they had begun a black youth mentorship program. And they had gone into schools and started to do some anti-black racism work with the students on their own. A community organization taking care of anti-black racism in the school system. But all of this was happening while swirling around me were more and more and more and more headlines of examples of racism in our school system in every single school board. It was popping up like wildfire. You know, sometimes there's topics that don't make it into mainstream news. Racism is one of those topics. Usually like one little story here, little corner, then you're done. But all of a sudden we were living in a period where every single school board was feeling empowered enough to speak out about their experiences of racism. Here's the thing. I thought to myself, well, I'm in a position of power. As the member of provincial parliament, it's a very powerful position. <laughs> TED Talks. Okay. I'm in a position of power and privilege. I have access to folks. So I spoke to leaders, I spoke to administrators, I spoke to ministers, I spoke to my colleagues. Every single person assured me that racism was not welcome here. Every single person. So then I had questions. Well, if racism isn't, isn't something that's acceptable here, it's not welcome here, then where are the resources to stop it? What are we actually doing on the ground to demonstrate to black, brown, and indigenous students, to black, brown, and indigenous educators, to black, brown, and indigenous superintendents and, and administrators and staff members that racism isn't actually welcome here. And I just want to repeat that one little section because we spend far too much time trying to make white folks believe that racism isn't there and far less time trying to let black, brown, and indigenous students know that we think that racism is at crisis levels in our school system. That's a problem. To achieve racial equity in schools, we have to be willing to talk about the extent of the problem. We have to be willing to be honest. We have to put down our guard and the pretenses, and we have to take seriously the experiences of racism that are being reported to us. But there were two pickles. The first pickle you may recognize. If you don't see yourself among the teaching, teachers, the staff members, the administration, you don't feel like you belong. I would argue most people agree that that's the case, would you not? Right, if you don't see yourself in positions of leadership, you don't feel like you belong. The second pickle is kind of interesting. When racialized people are missing from decision-making tables, what we usually say is that the solutions don't come as easily, right? You want racialized people to be at the decision-making table so we can be more creative about the solutions, but I don't think that's the actual pickle. I think the actual pickle is that if we are not present at decision-making tables, nobody believes that the problem is even urgent. That's the pickle. So to help, I made a handy-dandy chart. <laughs> when there's no sense of belonging, and there's no sense of urgency to address racism, cycles of racial injustice continue in schools. It's simple. You don't feel like you belong, Nobody thinks that there's urgency to address the problem, so the cycles continue and continue and continue. But wait, there's more. 
These cycles don't happen in a vacuum. Racism isn't happening in one little school over here, not even in one little school board over there, not even throughout just one little province. You have clues about what racism looks like if you look further than just inside the walls of your schools. Right here in southwestern Ontario, in 2018, there was a report based on uh, Statistics Canada, hate crime data. There was a fevered pitch of hate crimes right here, southwestern Ontario. If that is the social fabric in which we are trying to educate our students, we can only anticipate that there will be a rise of racism inside those schools. It's literally the context in which you are trying to educate people. But there's, there's hope, because also in that social fabric around us, we have elders who have been fighting this fight, who have been using the tools that they have available to them to address racism in meaningful ways. So, some of these elders have decided that as politicians, it's important to fight for, to use their power to change things like the curriculum in our schools, to make them more inclusive, to make sure that people that look like me are reflected in positive ways in the curriculum to fight for larger sort of provincial organizations that would be able to help schools to better understand how to approach anti-racism work in a meaningful way. But remember my handy-dandy chart? No sense of belonging, no sense of urgency to address racism means that the cycles of racial injustice continue in schools. This is the part when I think what we are accustomed to doing is hugging out racism. It's hilarious to me too, <laughs> me and you. <laughs> hugging out racism, what does that mean? It means exactly what we do right now. Racist incident occurs in school. Statement goes out, focus is on statement. Racism isn't welcome here, we don't like that. We're inclusive. We like different kinds of people. Come here, different people. Let me hug you. <laughs> but no time, attention, or resources are put towards addressing the root cause of the racist experience that just happened. Nobody's checking in with the students to see how they're doing. Nobody's changing the curriculum to make sure that this is addressed. Nobody's doing PD sessions to make sure that they actually do more than just diversity training. Hey, this is off script, but guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna do diversity training. Ready? Look around you. There's different people, right? Training done. <laughs> What's that gonna do? We have to do a little bit more. And the reason we have to do more is because the people that need to see that we're taking this seriously are the black, brown, and indigenous students in the school. The black, brown, and indigenous staff members, educators, educational workers, administrators, superintendents, need to know that you understand that this is urgent. There's ways that we can do it. The solutions are out there and they are actually plentiful. Critical race th theory, you could rewind, I felt very Jamaican in that moment. I used to go to house parties when I was small, so then I want to say, rewind, selector. Because <laughs> they said to me that I can say that and then they'll clip this part out. This is just for your pleasure. <laughs> and I can make like a real sentence and then when it goes out there, it'll be like a real grown-up was talking. <laughs> Critical race theory is a, an educational strategy that takes the experiences of racism for black, brown, and indigenous folks that are typically on the margins and puts it central in everything that you do. So when a teacher is going to go and find material to celebrate women, critical race theory will have them go and find racialized women, along with other women, but make sure that you pay attention to that as well. Critical race theory will allow administrators and educators 
to take seriously the examples of racial injustice that the students say are happening on the ground because you believe it is happening. But I don't want us to do critical race theory without also doing something else that is super cool, which is thinking about the intersectionality of all of the people that live here. So it's similar to what I was saying before. We're gonna celebrate women. I think we're actually doing a really good job of feeling comfortable and confident of addressing sexism. We're doing less of a good job when it comes to reminding ourselves that white women are not the only women that live in the world. And this is the moment where I know you're sitting at the edge of your seats. How can I help? How can I help? There's only one thing that you need to do. Mobilize your privilege. There are students out here that are listening to this. Talk to other students around you. Go to a school board meeting. Go as a collective and ask to do some of the fighting that I get asked to do. There are black, brown, and indigenous students that go to school and they don't have a place that they can just hang out because when they hang out somewhere, somebody polices them and tells them they're too loud, that they have to find somewhere else to go, that they're likely up to something. So fight along with your peers and try and find a good space for everybody. For the educators out there, think about race when you're building your curriculum, when you're deciding on what books to read, when you're deciding on what speakers to have in. Think outside of the typical resources. For administrators, ask for critical race theory as part of your professional development sessions. In fact, everyone should do that. As a parent, make sure that you ask, well, what's going on in the professional development sessions? Because I'd really like people to understand critical race theory. And then once you've done that session, ask for a follow-up session where everybody says, here's what we've been doing, here's what's worked, here's what hasn't, here's where we need help, and then just keep doing that. And guess what? There's students out there that are already doing it, so follow their lead. This is an amazing class from Cameron Heights, who were dealing with and learning about anti-Semitism and decided to bring in the Anne Frank Traveling Museum and then opened it up to community. And they were the guides. That was happening right here. We've got an overrepresentation of black and indigenous youth in care. One day, this group of black youth decided they were gonna write a report and they were gonna make different members of provincial parliament and different leaders in their community read the report and look at what happens to them as black and indigenous youth in care when they go to school. Read the report, use it in your classroom. Talk to your members of provincial parliament. They are not just available for photo ops. <laughs> they are actually supposed to be doing work for community. So show up in their offices and demand that we do better. Go to protests, I'm a mommy, my daughters are in that picture. Go with them. Students are asking for a indigenous-led curriculum to be integrated into everything that they do at school. So show up there and say, yeah, I'm with you, I think that's a great idea. I could go on and on and on. I have loads of pictures of places and people that, that have reached out to my office and said, this is what we're doing, and have asked me to amplify their voices because they are fighting for racial justice in our schools. But I also have three children. I showed you my daughters, and today I was practicing for this TED talk, and my son came up to me and he said, it's not fair, <laughs> literally. It's not fair that the girls are in this TED talk, and I am not. So, here he is. <laughs> yep. He's bringing you one final thought. The final thought is this. Sometimes we think that old systems can't change. The education system is an old system that, to be brutally honest, was actually based in some pretty racist things. The last segregated school in Ontario closed in 1965. We're dealing with a very long, sordid history of racism in 
Ontario. But there's hope, because Kendrick Lamar showed us that. Do you know Kendrick Lamar? Mm-hmm, yeah, clap for Kendrick. <laughs> nice. The same year that I was being invited for the first time to speak at Black Brilliance, Kendrick Lamar was being considered his album, Damn, for a Pulitzer Prize, an award that was given out for the first time in 1917, and I guarantee never thought that they would be giving it out to somebody like Kendrick Lamar. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for music for his album, Damn, which outlined the experience the nuance and complicated experiences of African-American men in this climate right now. So I have decided if the Pulitzer Award folks can decide that Kendrick Lamar is worthy of such a prize, then we can change our education system, no problem. Let's get ourselves a Pulitzer. <laughs> so I leave you with this. You got this. Talk about what's happening and call it what it is. It's racism. Support each other. When somebody comes to you and they say, I've had this experience, this is racist, you say, sure, okay, how are we gonna fix it? Remember that if you do not stand for something, you will fall for absolutely anything. If you do not stand for something, you will fall for anything. You're not gonna be able to win by hugging out racism, my friends. But if we invest, and invest in education in a way that ensures that we take racism seriously as a crisis, we can and we will do better. Thank you.